Oh, good. I've got plenty of material. Yeah. We might get through a couple of profits. All right, we are live. Yeah, I got to turn my phone on because just in case there's anyone else out there, although so far there's almost never anybody that texts except Sarah. Yeah, I said except Sarah. Yep, there you are. Here. Yep, gotcha. Live. All right. All right. Let's begin the prayer. Lord God, we give you thanks for gathering us around your word. We ask you, Lord, to open our hearts and our minds to hear you speak. This we ask in your name. Amen. All right. Let's see. Get down here so I can see comments. And. All right. So Hosea chapter 9 is where we are. Hosea 9. When someone finds it, give a page number. Yeah. Oh, because I have mine on the computer. Hosea 9. 1953. Chapter nine. Nine five nine. Okay. We got farming last week. We did what? We got pretty farming. I know. We're cooking. We're cooking now. Okay, Hosea nine. Rejoice not, O Israel. Exult not like the peoples, for you have played the whore, forsaking your God. You have loved a prostitute's wages on all the threshing floors. Threshing floor and wine vat shall not feed them, and new wine shall fail them. They shall, they shall not remain in the land of the Lord, but Ephraim shall return to Egypt, and they shall eat unclean food in Assyria. Hey, Dave. Okay, so, yeah, uh, God doesn't pull any punches. Uh, yeah, when he, uh, when, he, when he tells us, yeah, whoredom, that's my new favorite word. I'm going to... I'm challenging everybody to find new ways to use the word whoredom. You, sh yeah. you should, you should uh, use whoredom at least three times a week in your day-to-day uh, -day conversation just to see if you can do it. And rubbish. I like that rubbish. Rubbish. Yeah. Dung. Dung. Yeah, it's all poop to Paul. Yeah, da da uh, Darren uh, Taylor told me in all of his years in Lutheranism, he'd never heard the word poop from the pulpit. <laughs> I said, well, it's unfortunate because it's a really good word. <laughs> well, Paul's the one who uses it, not me. He's the one who says it's all poop. You know, just to, just I, so to talk about that from, you know, the, the word uh, that, that Paul uses, he, he uses uh, it's dung, uh, although in our text it shows up as rubbish. Uh, it's all rubbish. Uh, that in the uh, in the ancient culture, um, they didn't have indoor plumbing, right? Mm -hmm. And so every family had night buckets that you went to the bathroom in uh, during the night, from you know probably evening on through the night, you know. Uh, and uh, what, I, what I read one time, and I'm not sure how accurate this is historically, but uh, what I read one time was that it was typically the youngest person in the family's job, and I'm the youngest, so that was I was. Really, to carry the bucket, you know, and every morning you got up and you took the bucket, but somebody had to do it. You took the night bucket. Well, where did you dump the night bucket? Well, there's no sewers, you know, so you can't dump down the drain, so you carry it outside the city and they have a pile where you throw it. And I suppose after in the, in the desert, it dries out and you can burn it eventually, you know. Uh, so they probably move the pile around and, you know, you burn the, the, the poop. You know, and so the word he uses there for rubbish is the same word as they use for that pile that's outside the city that has to dry and and be burned. You know, and so it's the same Greek word, uh, and so I, that's why I love pointing that out to people. I t point out to confirmation kids every year uh, is that it's all poop to Paul. You know, so when you think that you know being a superstar athlete or being super rich or being super powerful uh, is is you know that's the goal of life. Um, listen, look at St. Paul. Here's this guy who had everything. I mean, when I say he's a sale maker, I didn't really explain that in the sermon Sunday, but that's a big deal in this, in, in that era. 
in that time being a, a, a consummate sale maker, wow, you know, that was important because, you know, you, you don't want to get out of the Mediterranean Sea and, and have uh, shoddy sails, you know, because you're going to end up shipwrecked, you know. And so being a, 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 a well-known, and he, could, and he made his living on making sails. So he made enough money off the sales he made, he never had to take any money from churches because he was so wealthy from his sail making. And then to go to the, to the rabbinical school of Gamaliel, that's the Harvard of that era. You know, that's, I mean, to, to be Gamaliel's student was huge. You know, that, I mean, and, and I'm sure very disappointing to Gamaliel that St. Paul ends up being a Christian. Um, so anyway, when he says, look, you want to you wanna pr compare credentials, here it is. And I don't care about any of it because all of it's just dung compared to knowing Christ. And it makes sense, right? Because if you get through this life and you're rich and powerful and, and this life is it, and you die and you're done. And you go off and, you know, uh, Danya, uh, Danya's mom had uh, really good friends who were Jewish and, and Danya was invited to their uh, home uh, for Shabbat, uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, Friday night Sabbath meal. And so she had the opportunity to, she got to see it. And it's it is very, it's fascinating. I've, I've gotten to see Shabbat several times over the years because I always tell everybody, you know, the Jews put me through seminary uh, because I worked all over, I worked Jewish parties all over Clayton and Ledoux uh, and they'd hire the seminarians because we wouldn't steal the silver. You know, I mean, you walked in some of these homes and, you know, they were very wealthy homes and had very nice stuff. And a problem they had was you'd hire help and some of your silver would walk off, you know. And so they liked to hire seminarians because we were trustworthy and generally hard workers, you know, by, by and large. And so anyway, I got to see a lot of Jewish meals. Shabbat, I got to see Passover. I got to see a Rosh Hashanah celebration. I got to see a lot, led by a rabbi. But, um, but she, anyway, so Danya got to see this. And it's fascinating. It's really interesting. And the, 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 I'm going to talk about this a little bit Wednesday night in the sermon. Uh, there, there's a word called Haggadah. And Haggadah is the telling, uh, it's the story. Uh, and for, for Jews, uh, something that we could learn from them as Christians is how important the story is, uh, that, that we need to stay connected to our history. Uh, if we don't stay connected to our history, you know, what is the old line? Those who do not know history are doomed to repeat it, right? Uh, and so the Jews are super good in their religious observances of telling the story every time because there are new ears there, you know? And the kids who were eight last year are nine this year and they may, they don't remember. But by the time they're, you know, 18, 19, 20 years old, they can almost recite the story. They've heard it so many times. It's why we have the same texts every year at Christmas, every year at Easter, you know, every year at Good Friday, every year at Monday, Thursday, we say it over and over and over again, because you need to be able to know the story. If you don't know the story, then then nothing else makes sense. Okay. Uh, so anyway, uh, at Shabbat, so she had, she watched them do the, the the whole thing, and she had the opportunity to talk to to uh, one of the people who participated, and and she says, well now she says, I don't know you know what flavor of Jew you are because you know there's there's three distinct different groups and she says but she says what do you believe uh about uh after life he says oh i don't i don't believe any of that stuff he said we just do all this as you know it's, this is all tradition he says, i don't believe any of that stuff and diane says you mean you believe that when you get through with your life here you're just done and he says yeah he says I, you just you wink out of existence you go and then when he when she he told her that a lot of things started making sense uh, about how they, um, everything about this world is what was important to them. Mm -hmm. It was all about this world. Uh, when her mom died, they came over and they asked to be able to take something home from her home that they could remember her by because she was, they were, she was very close to them. Mm -hmm. uh, to which we said, well, it's all kind of old junk, but you know, <laughs> feel free, you know, whatever you want, because most of it's going to goodwill, if, you know. And uh, but they were, I mean, they went through her possessions like they were treasures, you know, mm -hmm. because it, it, the things of this world are so important. Because when, once you die, that's it, you're done. Yeah, and they were all, and it's very sad. 
it's very sad to live life like that. Uh, it really causes you to have some some uh, compassion uh, for people who who don't have faith in Christ, because you know, and, and and you know, any amount of faith in Christ is saving faith. Faith is either on or off, right? Faith isn't a rheostat. Like, well, I almost got into heaven, but I didn't have quite enough faith. You know, it's either on or off. There's either faith or there's not. So they don't, do they believe that a human body is a soul? No. They, they, this particular group, I mean, some Jews do, but this particular group family did not, no. They didn't believe in anything. About, they, they only, they were, and interestingly enough, they were both medical doctors. Yeah. Very scientific people, you know, and just didn't believe any of that. Uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Metaphysical. Any, any of the metaphysical stuff. Nothing. They live in a different world, obviously. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. Very nice people. Great people. Oh, yeah. Very kind to, to Danya's mom. Uh, very polite. Very giving uh, to her. You know, they did a lot of things. We're always remembering her and taking her out for ice cream and things like that, you know. Very nice people. But what a sad life yeah. to live your whole life. Yeah, it was actually, I was actually reading the story, I was thinking of, like, people who um, are so concerned with matching, uh, like, into their program, mm -hmm. she was a medical student, she's a third year, and she was so focused, well, like, what if my scores aren't good enough, what if this, what if that, I'm like, all right, so the worst thing is, because I've had this conversation multiple times, what's the worst that's going to happen, you don't yep. match, she's like, well, what if I don't match, I'm like, we don't match, then you soap, well, I can't soap it, I'm just like, so you soap, and you go into this, and she's You want to explain you soaping for oh, sorry. So the like crowd? When you, when you match, you like have your program that you apply to. And then if you don't match, you can do what's called soaping, which is basically like applying for a position for your first year, which may or may not be actually in your specialty. And oftentimes it's not, and people think it's like this devastating thing that's going to crush your life and you can't make anything out of your life. And you're like, it's not that bad. And so I think back and I'm like, it's going to work out. And she's just like, well, what if I don't soap? And I'm like, well, then you do a research year. And she just like kept spiraling down into like this pit of what if I don't do that? And just, yeah. So I think to myself, I'm like so happy that I have faith that like it's all going to work out. Like if I didn't match, that wasn't part of God's plan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I matched and it's part of God's plan. I keep just moving forward and mm -hmm. I'm less scared about that, but thinking about that, I'm just like, how how devastating is it that people just like, they live and die on whether or not they match into that program, and if it's, it's just, it's crazy. Well, and God also, you know, God demonstrated to you, you know, his guidance. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, when, when after four years, oh, yeah. you know, you didn't get into medical school. Yep. And I mean, that was huge. What am I going to do? And, and, you know, there, it, he opened up another door. In yeah, comes funny. the... Like looking back and like thinking, you know, what, what would life have been like if I had done medical school early and then thinking about all the stuff that I had gone through, then gone to medical school, and now do And so I think like, man, if I hadn't done the way that he wanted it and been on the path, then it would have yeah. been like so different and just, I don't know, if you think back and you're like, ah, all right. It's interesting yeah. because, you know, there, there are people who think, who, who, who believe that the educational system for a lot of professions has got it wrong. Yep. Um, that, yep. <laughs> that, that, and I, I speak to it from a theological perspective, that there's a great many people who think that you should not go straight from, um, college to seminary to the parish mm -hmm. that you could that you should have some years of experience between college and seminary uh and also probably between seminary and the parish and and there's some people who have, who have proposed a system where you would have that you would have uh four years of college two years of some kind of you know other kind of work uh four years of seminary two years of apprenticeship and then you would actually become a pastor at like 31 or 32 or something like that as opposed to 26 uh because it's really really hard being a 26 year old pastor mm -hmm. it is really hard uh and it's it causes so much stress and so much grief uh so my point is is that god god created that system for you yeah. 
you had the four years of, of undergrad, five years of doing something else in the world, and then back to medicine, which was kind of your passion. Yeah, it's always kind of funny thinking of like the 26 year olds who are practicing or like in their, in their time. Um, and I always think to myself, like, why didn't they know how to do this? Or why didn't they think about it like this? Or why did they act that way? And I keep, I have to remind myself, oh yeah, I forget. I'm that much older. You're five years older. Yeah. They just don't yeah. have that. And while, you know, while there's not a significant difference between 40 and 45, there's a huge difference between 26 and 31. Gigantic. You know, there's a gulf. Uh, I, in fact, I would say that there, that's, that's one of the huge developmental leaps in life is, is between uh, 25 and 30 in that area. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the biggest developmental leap a human being takes is between zero and three. You know, but then the other big ones, there's another big one between eighth and ninth grade. Yeah. You know, there's a, is, a right, right. There's a huge one between ninth and tenth grade. Yes, yes. you know, very much so on that one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it would it, our educational system would be better mm -hmm. to teach sixth and seventh graders together, eighth graders alone, ninth graders alone, and then tenth through twelfth graders together, because there's such a developmental leap in those years that you know. My high school was 10, 11, 12. Yeah, it's the way it used to always be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Junior yeah. high was usually uh, six, seven, eight, nine. nine yeah. Yep, or, junior. Or seven, eight, nine, one of those. Yeah, so junior high was either seven, eight, nine, or eight, and nine. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or you had a K well, through yeah, eight I school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. school K eight, so right. You know, if you talk about the uh, stress of a 26 year old pastor, but well, we live in America. Think about the financial stress. That'll wait until you're 31. I mean, it's bad enough already. I mean, you know, it's expensive. You, yeah. know, you got to think about that, you know. And you but don't you start working to pay these bills back till you're 30 in your 30s. You know, when do you get paid back, you know? Eventually. <laughs> 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 That's exactly right. That's exactly right. God brought you here. God will work it out. Well, sure. Yeah, I mean, you, you have to, I mean, and that's another, that's another problem is, you know, what I talked to, to Neil and Noah about, you know, because it would, you know, don't go to college these days unless you know what you want to do. Because you're going to end up with eighty, ninety thousand dollars $90,000 of debt and, no, and, and not want to do what you're trained to do. And you might not be trained to do anything. Yep. You know, so you get, I mean, you get a degree in art history, you know, <laughs> try to get a job doing that, you know. If you got a rich dad, he can afford to write the checks, fine, do what you want. But, you know, if you're borrowing money, you better be get, doing something that's going to get you a job. You know, and that's and both Neil and Noah agreed with that and said, yeah, you know, Noah, I'm not sure Noah will ever go to school. Um, he's doing certification programs and things like that. But, uh, you know, Neil wants to go to school now, but he's 29 years old and, and Uncle Sam pays for it. Uh -huh. So <laughs> that's the way to do it. Yeah. So, um, let's see what I was going to say about the text. Uh, oh, before I got, whoredom, I got off on this on whoredom, see? Uh, this is a really interesting thing here, uh, chapter 9, Hosea 9. Yeah, we're still in Hosea, Dave. Stop judging. Uh, the, the interesting thing is here, uh, your prostitutes wages on the threshing floor, threshing floor and wine vat shall not feed them. Uh, apparently, many of the ceremonies to Baal were done on threshing floors and wine vats. You know, that's, so that's the, the, the illusion there that God's giving, uh, is that uh, you, you're doing all of these uh, ceremonies. Yeah. What's a threshing floor? Where they thresh the grain, they take the grain into a, a room and they beat the grain on a rack. You keep using that word. I don't know what it's Yeah, called. yeah, threshing the grain. Because, yeah, because you're such a farm girl. You, I'm oh, sure you yeah. remember when you went out on the farm. and Yeah, you have to thresh the grain to get the grain separated from the stalk. And, the, and then to get the, the, the kernel separated from the husk. That's how they, and, and, and nowadays they have machines that do it. Back in these days, they had this wire rack, kind of, not wire, but I don't know, some kind of rack thing. And they beat the grain on it, uh, and you know, and then the they would gather up the kernels that fell out, and and you know that's how you would 
get your 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 uh, kernel of wheat. So, right, and so, and so, what he's saying there is when you're doing ceremonies to Baal on the threshing floor and the wine vat, because what are you praying for when you're when you're doing ceremonies for the threshing floor and the wine vat? What are you praying to Baal for? Good crop, sure, yeah, good good harvest, good wine, good wheat, good whatever. You're like a whore, okay? You're like oh, you 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 know, he's pimping you. You know, and you're instead of worshiping God, you're worshiping this false lover. You know, you're you're whoring yourself out to this false god. That's that's the whole uh, the illusion of all of Hosea is always prostitution. That when you put something above God, you're prostituting yourself. Um, the, the, and and that's sometimes that's a difficult thing for human beings. Uh, because we like to we like to think in very black and white terms uh, that if we're not on the street collecting money for sex, we're not prostituting ourselves. Okay, not according to God. According to God, every time you put something or someone above Him, you're prostituting yourself. You're selling your you're selling what is most important, your soul. You know the most important thing you possess is your soul. And you're selling that for something else. And by selling it, I mean you're, you're giving it away to get something that's selling, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Bishop uh, said that years and years ago. And I always thought that was the, one of the best things he ever said is the only thing you ever got in this world is time. Yeah. That was the only gift you ever got. What you do with that time is, is what matters. God gave you time. Maybe he gave you like Levere 11, 100 years almost. Maybe he gave you 10 years. Maybe whatever he gave you, he gave you. But what you do with that time, you're going to sell some of that time because you need to eat and have a place to live and a car to drive. Uh, you're going to give away some of that time. You're going to enjoy some of that time for yourself. But, but recognize that time is the commodity that you possess. That's really all you possess. Nothing else is yours. Um... So is this, you know, you got the whores threshing and, and stomping grapes in the wine vat, the threshing floor uh, here in Hosea. Is it any different from people today who call themselves Christian, but instead of doing things for God or with God or whatever, uh, they choose other things above God? Uh, you know, I used, to have a, uh, I used to have a member in another church who flat out told me that he, I'd never see him on Sunday during uh, football season. Just flat out said it. Yeah, no, I, I watch football on Sundays. Really? When do you worship? Well, I don't worship during football season. Well, it started well this was on the West Coast. <laughs> yeah. So it started earlier for us than it does for you. Uh, yeah, so yeah, most... Was credit, though, at least he admitted it. Yeah. <laughs> he was a great guy. I loved him. He was wonderful. But I mean, he flat out would just tell me, "No, you won't see me. It's football season. Won't see me back until after the after the Super Bowl." And he literally was gone every year from the middle of August to the middle until you know first part of February, whenever the Super Bowl was. Never saw him. Never saw him any time during that period of time. Until the eight o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> you can't pregame. You know. I mean, this guy uh, and and. Oh, if, if if they were in town, absolutely. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. absolutely. But but he every game it was like a religious thing for him. It was not. I mean, this was not just like like I you know I might turn on the Bears when I get home from church, and watch fifteen minutes before I'm disappointed and and you know and or I fall asleep. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't take long watching the Bears to get disappointed, and disheartened, and just give up. Uh, but, you know, yeah, I mean, this is not like that for him. He got up early in the morning and began preparing everything that was going to happen that day from the food that they were going to eat and the clothes that he was, he had, he had certain outfits that he wore. He had socks that he had to wear. He had to, you had to have certain socks uh, that were his lucky socks that you had to wear on game days. And I mean, it was, it was religious. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And this is exactly what God's talking about here. Yeah, you're a whore on the threshing floor. 
You know, you're just you're just giving it giving it up for for the NFL instead of for Baal. It's no different though. Yeah, I don't know. I never asked. Was this Seattle? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I never asked. We better not. I don't know. Uh, people go where their gods are. Yep. Don't fool yourself. People go where their gods are. It means same as what Jesus said. You, you, where your heart is. That's where your treasure is going to be. Where your heart is, that's where your treasure is going to be. Every time. You want to figure out, if you don't know where your heart is, look at where your treasure is. That's where your heart is. You know, same thing with people, you know, with this. You know, go to the threshing floor to worship Baal. That's where your heart is. You know, just be honest. Uh, you know, I, I, I think that, um, like this guy, you know, t telling me you're not going to see me during football season. I appreciate honesty far more than hypocrisy. Hypocrisy drives me nuts. You know, the, 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 the uh, oh, I'm a, I, I'm a fine, upstanding Christian, except when it's inconvenient. You know, then, then I'm not a, then I'll do what I want. And, I, uh, and I'll make up some, you know, story about how I had to do it. Whatever it was, you know, doesn't matter. Just be honest. Be honest, you know. Don't, don't try to lie to God, because he knows what you're doing and what you're thinking. Um... Verse 4, they shall not pour drink offerings of wine to the Lord, and their sacrifices shall not please him. It shall be like mourner's bread to them. All who eat of it will be defiled, for their bread shall be for the hunger only. It shall not come to the house of the Lord. Uh, what will you do on the day of the appointed festival and on the day of the feast of the Lord? For behold, they are going away from destruction, but Egypt shall gather them. Memphis shall bury them. Nettles shall possess their precious things of silver. Thorns shall be their tents. The days of punishment have come. The days of recompense have come. Israel shall know it. The prophet is a fool. The man of the spirit is mad because of your great iniquity and great hatred. So lots of stuff in there. Um, in exile, not only will they be cut off from God, but they have no temple. Okay, So no means by which to approach God. Pouring their drink offering out to God. Yeah, you can't you can't make sacrifices when you got no temple because the temple is going to be destroyed. Okay, uh, the tickle of Fleezer is going to sack the temple too. Uh, not tickle Fleezer, um, Nebuchadnezzar is going to sack the temple. Uh, your offerings will not be accepted, and you cannot run away. Not do you any good. There is no other god. Uh, you can't go to M Egypt. That's what they're you know they're trying to make allegiances with Egypt to get away from God. Uh, Egypt will bury you. Memphis will bury you. Nettles shall possess, pr possess your precious things of silver. Thorns shall be their tents. Um, you know what nettles are, right? No. Oh, oh, those there. Oh, nettles are terrible. The, the, you, I don't know. Do we not have nettles here? Maybe we don't. No, I always think of them like the little things that get caught up in the dog. Uh, -uh no, nettles are stinging plants. Oh, yeah. uh, we have them. We have them in. in Texas? Yeah. No, no, uh. -uh. No, they, no, not not like jumping choya. No, these are leafy plants, and they have little tiny fibrous, uh, almost like threads on them. And if you brush up against them, they sting the crud out of you on your on your skin. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't think we have them maybe up here. I don't know. Maybe down in. And I know we have them. We have them in uh, Kentucky. I know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Because, uh, yeah, because when I took kids on retreat in Kentucky, almost every year someone got into nettles. Uh, yeah, and I'm pretty sure we had them in Seattle, too. Uh, yeah, they're stinging plants. They sting like... Are they, are they a green plant? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're green and they, uh, they yeah, they, they grow so high, something like that. They're not vines, no. They're, they're leafy plants. But they, they, it's really easy to not notice them and brush by them. And when, when you do, you'll notice them. Because <laughs> they have a, it leaves almost like a burn where they. I've seen them. I think I've successfully avoided them. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah, they get in your fur. Right. Yeah, they, get fur. they get in the dog's fur all the time. Yeah. The dog's fur, though, thing. Mm hmm. Yeah, burrs. Yeah, yeah. No, the stinging nettles. No, they just they just burn. It's pretty. Yeah. I think I. Is this what you're talking about? Yeah. 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 Ye
Yep, that's it. Yeah, I've seen it. Yep. I somehow successfully avoided them. <laughs> the root and yep. the above ground parts are used for diabetes. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> the root and the above ground parts are used for di treatment of diabetes, apparently. The single metal plate is approximately two to four meters tall. Really? They get that big? I've never seen them that big. Four to six feet tall. Yeah, I've never seen wow. them. It's found in every province and state except Hawaii. Oh, it is found here. I guess it maybe just not. I don't see. I've never never experienced it here. Maybe like Southern Illinois. Yeah. Maybe. Check out Illinois and see which Because that's very important. We need to track down the nettles here. <laughs> okay. Uh, so the point is, is there no other God? Um, the, the, uh, when he says the prophet is a fool, the man of the spirit is mad. Uh, what he's saying there is you can't make God say what you want him to say. Okay. You can't make God say what you want him to say. And there's, there's so many religions and more specifically denominations today that, uh, that, that, that want God, to, they want God to be this way. Or they want God to be that way, and and they just make up stuff. You know, you just you, where do you get that? Well, I just think I just I just think this, or or no, I feel. There you go. I just feel that God blah 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 blah. Okay, where does it say that in the Word? Where does it say that? Show me where it says that in the Word. Well, I don't know. I don't. It doesn't say it in the Word. I just feel that. Well, good for you. I'm glad you have that feeling. Gloria said last night that one of her friends told her, she's Catholic, that the Bible needs, is going to get rewritten now because society is changing so much. Oh, yeah, okay. Well. Oh, Lori, she was me writing. Yeah. Who's me writing? A special commission. Yeah, special commission, yeah. Yeah, you know, I mean, you just, that's the problem is that, is that we, we want God. We want, and, and this is nothing not new with us. No. Every no. generation has wanted God to say this or that. You know, I mean, every every culture has wanted God to say this or that. You know, it's whatever whatever it blows your skirt, cranks your tractor. You know, get try to get God to say it. You know, and then I can do it. I mean, it's nothing new. This is exactly what he's saying. Yeah. The prophet is a fool. The man of the spirit is mad because of your great iniquity and, and your great hatred. Um, I am fully confident that when I am speaking God's word, I'm right. And that really ticks people off. Because okay? I have no shame in saying, no, I know I'm right. Because I'm speaking God's word. I have no confidence in my words. I have no confidence in my ideas. They might be right, they might not. It might be a good idea, it might be a bad idea. It might work, it might not. I don't know. But when I'm speaking God's word... Completely confident that I'm right. Uh, Self-confidence uh, in yourself is called arrogance. Mm -hmm. Okay, Self-confidence in yourself is called arrogance. Self-confidence in God is godly. If you're, if you're saying, what, and that's why in worship, it's important that we're saying what God has said. That's why I have no confidence in, you know, these people who write, think they're poets, you know, and write weird stuff, you know, and say, oh, we're going to worship by do by saying this. Okay, what? Who are you? I know who Paul is. I don't know who you are. You know, and, and, and I'm glad you think you're a poet. But, <laughs> you know, I want to say what God says, which is you look at our worship, go through the hymnal. Try to find in the hymnal things that aren't almost direct quotes, if not direct quotes, from Scripture. You got the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, and the Athanasian Creed. Not quoted in Scripture. We, 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 those, are, uh, those are systematic statements of the faith. In other words, they are things we draw from the, from the Bible. Okay? But they are not quoted in Scripture. Practically everything else. Oh, the sermon, obviously, is an explication of Scripture. But the sermon should not say anything the scripture doesn't say. And I've always, anybody, anytime anyone complains about my sermon uh, to me, I've always told them, show me where I'm wrong from scripture and I'll publicly apologize. You know, because, yeah, could I get it wrong? Yeah, it's possible I could get it wrong. 
after 30 years of doing it, it's not going to be often. But yeah, it could happen. I could overstate something or, or, or state something uh, in a way that, that comes off wrong from Scripture. Sure, it could. Yeah, show me where I'm wrong. I apologize. Yeah. The book of Concord is like that too, isn't it? I mean, it's derived from what the Bible Correct. Says. In fact, we're going to talk about that Sunday. Uh, is that there's you know there's two different ways to, sub, sub, to subscribe to the Book of Concord, quia and quatenus. Quia is the way the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod subscribes to the Book of Concord, because is what quia means. We believe this because it is a clear explication of Scripture. The ELCA subscribes quatenus. We believe this in so far as it is a clear explication of Scripture. Okay, so a quatenus of scripture means somebody else decides what is and isn't a clear explication of scripture. That's why the ELCA does so many things that we don't, or allows so many things that we don't, because they subscribe quatenus. To be fair to them, they are being true to their confession. Is it okay. the same Book of Concord? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, they own the Book of Concord. That's, that's one of the funny things about it is that, you know, they actually own their, it's sort of like in the Mormon church. Uh, it's the, it's the, um, let's see, which one is it? It's, yeah, it's the Community of Christ, which is the one out of Nauvoo, Illinois, that owns uh, the Book of Mormon. And so it drives the Salt Lake City folks crazy that they have to pay, <laughs> they have to pay uh, royalties to the community of Christ to, to print the Book of Mormon. We have to do the same thing. Every time we buy the uh, Book of Concord, we have to pay royalties to the ELCA, which is Augsburg, For Augsburg Fortress, because they own the Book of Concord. <laughs> now, I don't know what this new, this new reader's edition, I don't know how that works, because you know, we just have that new edition that's been printed, and that's printed by Concordia Publishing House, but I don't know how the, I don't know how the, the um, copyright stuff works with that. But at one time, it was Augsburg Fortress. When I went to college, I had to buy my Book of Concord from Augsburg Fortress because they owned it, uh, which is kind of funny. But yeah, so, so to be fair, they are true to their subscription. They subscribe insofar as they clearly say, we don't believe everything that is, that we are not bound by everything in this book. We don't believe that. We believe that we're bound insofar as it agrees with scripture as we interpret it. This publishing the way it works. Somebody published it in English, and okay. and uh, they were the ones who did it. And then they ended up being at one time Augsburg Fortress was uh, I can't remember where, I don't remember whether they were L ALC or LCA <coughs> publishing house, but it's just the way it happened. It was by no, no. Uh, the no. parts of it were um, the small small catechism and large catechism written by Luther. The Augsburg Confession, Apology of the Augsburg Confession, were mostly written by Melanchthon. Uh, Treatise on the Power and Primacy of the Pope is written by Luther. Small, car, small called articles are written by Luther. And Formula Concord was largely written by Chemnitz, uh, with help from others, but, but mostly Chemnitz. Because the Formula Concord was written after Luther's death, because all the wheels were coming off the wagon once Luther died, because he was the one who kept everything together. He died and people started, you know, all the nuts started falling off the trees in all directions, you know. And so Chemnitz came along, gathered a group of people together, said, okay, we got to write some stuff down here about what we believe about this stuff. You know, and it's, and it's all, and, and the Formula Concord addresses all the kind of major areas of doctrine. What do we believe about baptism? What do we believe about the Lord's Supper? What do we, you know. Um, let's see. Okay, moving on. Verse 8. The prophet is the watchman of Ephraim with my God. Yet a fowler's snare is on all his ways, and hatred in the house of his God. They have deeply corrupted themselves, as in the days of Gibeah. He will remember their iniquity. He will punish their sins. Um, so the days of Gibeah there, that's uh, the, what he's talking about there, is where um, the uh, travelers came and uh, were staying at somebody's house, and the men of Gibeah uh, wanted him to send his, the uh, travelers out so they could have sex with him because that was typical is that you know homosexuality was rampant in those days uh, unlike today you know where, where actually according to some statistics that I was reading the other day 
uh, you know, the, the uh, people who are uh, gay, it's a very small percentage. You, you would think from looking at society that everybody, every other, I, I told Dave here a while back that I thought he and I were the last two straight men in America. Uh, <laughs> But he told me, no, he needs some others. So, uh, no, but it's actually 1%. Yeah, I read that too. 1%. Yeah. yeah. And, yet, and yet, look at TV and commercials. You would think that at least 50% of the people are, are gay or transgender or something. You know. Anyway, in Gibeah, we had the same problem. Uh, it was very common uh, for the gay guys, if the stranger came into town, they wanted to have sex with them. And uh, and so the you can read the story in uh, let me see where that is First Kings I want to say if you want you know some, for some bedtime reading tonight about you know <laughs> if you want to do have a little bedtime reading about gay rape you know sometimes sometimes it's a nice nice little story to read at night you know something for the kids um, let's see uh, <laughs> Let's see here. Days of Gibeah, Judges 19. Yeah, Judges 19, if you want to read the story uh, of the, the men of Gibeah. Uh, I think it's Judges 19. I think that's right. Maybe I'm wrong, though. Hold on. Maybe correct me. So Days of Gibeah. Oh, well, you, have to, you can find it. But anyway, um, it's... it's uh, yeah, Days of Gibeah refers to the appalling sexual crime committed years earlier by some residents of Gibeah. These Benjamites, thwarted in their attempt to rape a visiting Levite, abused the man's concubine all night until she fell dead. Uh, as a consequence, all Israel attacked the tribe of Benjamin, killing 25,000 men. It's a beautiful story. Uh, I, always tell the, I, I always tell the middle schoolers, I said, you're, you know, you're, if your parents knew it was in the book of Judges, they wouldn't allow you to read it. And then they promptly go home and read the book of Judges <laughs> because it's cool stuff. I mean, you have, you have, you have tent stakes through people's heads. You have left-handed men killing the king while he's on the pot. You know, it's, it's awesome. It's an awesome book. Uh, I can't believe that Hollywood hadn't figured it out yet that the book of Judges would make a great miniseries or a great, uh, you know, TV Netflix or something. They need to do something with the book of Judges. It's awesome. Anyway, so... so I don't teach, I don't teach, they, there's a reason they don't let me teach little kids here, Dave. <laughs> I'm allowed to talk about the gospel. <laughs> That's it. Then go back to your adult class. Uh, yeah, so, um, so they've corrected themselves in the days of Gibeah. Just talking about, you know, what he's really saying here is the way sin ramps up, you know, and we, and we think to ourselves, how could anything like that happen? Come on. You know, how could this, how could the world be that bad? That's how sin works. When sin is left unchecked, it keeps ramping up. And this is what's happened to the people of Israel at this time, is that sin has gotten to the point where in the northern kingdom, where the people are just, they're horrible. They're doing horrible things. They're uh, cheating each other. They're, 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 come on in, Keith, set up whatever you need to. Uh, they're, they're, uh, they're cheating each other for money. They're, they're lying on their scales so that they make more money. I mean, it's, it's, it's horrible, and it just keeps on getting worse. Uh, Hosea is, is, like all the true prophets, is despised by those who are false. Um, you know, the prophet is not here to be your friend or your co-conspirator. Uh, the prophet is placed by God in a place to speak God's truth. Okay, that's the way it is. That's the way it still is with pastors. Uh, sometimes that truth will bring you joy. Sometimes it'll bring you anger. Sometimes it'll bring you frustration. Not the prophet's issue. He's telling you what God says. Okay? And he always has to be sure that he's saying what God says. Uh, the, and then, the, of course, the final, the final insult is when people of God no longer listen to God's messengers and even disrespect them. And that's where the Gibeah comes in. Is where uh, you know they're not only did they try to rape him, but then they they um, uh, killed his concubine because uh, apparently prophets were allowed to have girlfriends in those days, and uh, you know, had a concubine. Um, but and here's what he did. Yeah, I hear this. This is my favorite part of it. In order to make a point, he cut his concubine up into into twelve parts and sent a part of her to each tribe. 
Oh. Yeah, to make the point uh, that this is what God is going to do to you for what you did to this, to this, what would you allowed to happen to this woman? This is how he treats evil. Is it, yeah, read it, Judges. It's great. It's a great book. Uh, like great, uh, verse ten. Uh, like grapes in the wilderness, he I found Israel. Like the first fruit on the fig tree, in its first season, I saw your fathers. But they came to Baal Peor and consecrated themselves to the thing of shame, and became detestable, like the thing they loved. Ephraim's glory shall fly away like a bird. No birth, no pregnancy, no conception. Even if they bring up children, I will bereave them till none is left. Woe to them when I depart from them. Ephraim, as I have seen, that's northern kingdom, as I have seen was like a young palm planted in a meadow. But Ephraim must lead his children out to slaughter. Give them, O Lord, what, give them, O Lord, what will you give? Give them a miscarrying womb and dry breasts. Every evil of theirs is in Gilgal. That's where they sacrificed uh, false altars. There I began to hate them. Because of the wickedness of their deeds, I will drive them out of my house. I will love them no more. All their princes are rebels. I love to bring up the, this line to people who, who think that God is the loving grandpa that bounces you on his knee. God hates them. What prevents God from hating you? Because you all sin too. Yeah. If you need help with that, invite me over sometime. I'll, we'll go through the list for you. What? Jesus. Yeah. That's all that prevents God from hating you. Is because when he looks at you, he doesn't see you. He sees Jesus covering you. Jesus talks about being the mother hen that covers the, the chicks with his wings. Okay, That's how it is for you. When God looks at you, he sees Jesus. That's why you have salvation. That's why you have a place in paradise. Not because of who you are, but because of what Jesus has done for you. Ephraim is stricken. Their root is dried up. They shall bear no fruit. Even though they give birth, I'll put their beloved children to death. Hmm. So much for a loving grandpa. My God will reject them because they have not listened to him. They shall be wanderers among the nations. Uh, the, the bottom line in chapter 9 is God has had enough of the whoredom. Okay, he's had enough. And, and it's all going to come to an end uh, for Israel. We're going to stop early tonight because Keith needs to get set up for Dorcas. Um, Dorcas is having a uh, beekeeping uh, lecture tonight. Uh, but yeah, so ch you know, uh, chapter, chapter 9 is, is all about God saying, I'm done. Yeah, I've had enough. All right. Any questions, comments, deep thoughts? I should go to the comments here. Oh, Danya's been talking and I didn't catch it. Sorry. Uh, let's see. Okay, she didn't say anything. That we needed. Yeah. All right, let's close with prayer. Lord, bless us and keep us. The Lord, make his face shine upon us and be gracious unto us. The Lord, that his countenance upon us and give us peace. Amen. All right, back next week with chapter 10.